This is the video for November 21st. So what follows is a reading and a sermon, a short reading and a short sermon for this coming Sunday, followed by some excerpts, some portions of last week's Zoom service at 9.20 each week, and last week's in-person service, videos from that in-person service, which we have at 10 o'clock each week. Here is the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of enlightenment, this world can be overwhelmed by falsehood, but you send your message and increase our joy, and for your accompaniment, we are grateful. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, the ninth chapter. The people who walked in despair have seen a new hope. There will be no gloom for those. Oh my God. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, the ninth chapter. The people who walked in despair have seen a new hope. The reading. There will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. The prophets were hard on people. They called people out for their sins. Most people don't like that, but when Christians and Jews read the Bible, we are hearing words that cut us to the heart, that call us out for our sins. It's remarkable, really, that a book that so consistently criticizes an entire nation became the sacred scripture of that people for tens of thousands of years down to today. It is not a book to make people feel good about themselves. It was not promoting Israel or painting its leaders in a good light. The Bible consistently and repeatedly tells us that we are unfaithful, we are unreliable, we are stubborn, we are quick to forget. It is a book for people who want to see themselves honestly. Some people imagine that Lutherans go easier on people. We don't force rules on people. But Lutherans have no illusion about the sinfulness of people and does not want us, and do not want us, to forget our sinfulness. Lutherans, and the Bible that we hold as our authority, the source and norm of our faith, tell us that we disappoint each other and God as a matter of course. The Bible calls us to acknowledge our sinfulness. Like AA, like recovery programs, our first step is to acknowledge we have a problem. We begin each Sunday confessing our sin. No one should think that Lutherans are unconcerned about sin. No one should think Lutherans are casual about our need to acknowledge sin. We know that on October 31st, 1517, Luther posted his 95 Theses, the first of which says, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, Matthew 4:17." He willed the entire life of the Christian, of believers, to be one of repentance. 
my job each Sunday is to remind myself and all of us that we are sinners. And also to say, we are assured of God's love of sinners. Jesus was sent into the world to give his life for sinners. If we know we are sinners, we know Jesus died for us. You've heard me reference that 70s song, Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. We believe that if Jesus died for us, that if we are following the gospel, the gospel tells us we are sinners, sinners of God's own redeeming. It is bizarre to me that there are Christians who speak and act as if Christians are superior. It is bizarre that anyone who hears Jesus' message, his call to humble service and love, should think Christians should amass power. It is, a strange distortion, it is a strange distortion of the Christian gospel, which all of us should be aware of. We should recognize it when we hear it and reject it out of hand. Reject it because it robs the cross of Christ of its meaning. It builds us up on a sinful, self-righteous pride and twists God's love into hate. There are people in our nation today who are Christian nationalists. Christian white nationalists. Anytime someone stands up for Christian nationalism, it is incumbent upon the rest of us to disavow that heresy and the hate and violence it incites. Last week at a conference called Awaken America, a speaker called for a nation that allows only one faith. Michael Flynn told his audience, if we are going to have one nation under God, which we must, we have to have one religion. One nation under God, one religion under God. No Christian should allow such a comment to pass unopposed. We cannot allow people to think that we support such a view and should not let people think we are unconcerned about the effect it will have. While none of us likes the increasingly volatile public discourse in our nation, speeches that promote white supremacy, Christian white nationalism need to be condemned. It all begs the question, what is a Christian? What do Christians do? How do we behave? How do we treat each other and our neighbors? Words are powerful. And words that speak intolerance create a society of exclusion and persecution. So Lutherans, reading our Bible, hear that we are sinful, that we should acknowledge our sinfulness, that we should be humble about it, while at the same time we are called to be in the world working for justice, being agents of healing, being messengers of hope. If we're so flawed, why does God choose us to such an important mission? To bring justice, to bring healing. Why would God choose flawed people to do that? That's one of those many paradoxes of our faith, that we are flawed, and yet it is us that God wants to use to fulfill this mission of justice, of peace, of hope, of love. We are flawed and we are called. Some people will use the refrain that God does not call the qualified. God qualifies the called. So if we first acknowledge that we are sinful, that we are flawed, and then we believe that we are called to do God's work in this world, to be God's hands in this world, how do we reconcile that contradiction? that we as flawed, sinful people should be doing God's work. Just two things I want you to think about in this regard. First, we cannot work by ourselves, not as individuals, not as Christians alone. That is what it means to be humbly aware of our sinfulness, to say, I'm not gonna do this on my own. I'm not gonna do this saying Christians have to do this. I'm not gonna say this, I'm not gonna do this saying I have to do this. That's what it means to be humble and to be aware of your sinfulness and to realize you have important work to do in God's kingdom. Second, we cannot put ourselves first. What a ridiculous heresy to say Christians come first, 
or I come first, or my nation comes first, if you're following Jesus. You cannot put yourself first. Jesus clearly says that. Whoever wants to be the leader, whoever wants to be my follower, cannot be first among others, but must be last. Cannot be pushing other people around, but must be serving each other. If we cannot admit our flaws and faults, we cannot be trusted with great responsibility. So let us remember that we are sinners. Let us hear that word again and again in the Bible and know that it is about us. And let us know that we are called to be God's people, to do God's work. Hi, Kim. Hello, Russell. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, who are you? Okay, I think here comes Pastor to save the day. <laughs> oh, very good. Okay, Ellie, I'm sorry, which is your reading? Yes, I okay. can. I'm reading from uh, the book of Amos. The, the... Okay, very, very good. Okay. Welcome to this service of worship this morning. And today we'll begin with a psalm that uh, will be read by Katie. Speak loud. Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> we'll continue with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the maker of heaven and earth, the word made flesh, the Lord and giver of life. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. When we were laid low by sin and guilt, God made us alive together with Christ, forgiving us all our trespasses by taking our sins to the cross. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Rejoice in the good news. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of all nations and people without a state, show us how to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Create justice and righteousness in us that all may rejoice in your blessings. Amen. Amen. Okay. Ellie will read the uh, text from the prophet Amos. A reading from the prophet Amos from the first chapter and fifth. Let us just let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Josiah of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither and the top of Carmel dries up. Seek God, good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you just as you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I will not accept them, and the offerings of well-being of your fated animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. Be let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Good News According to John, the seventh chapter. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. The gospel of the Lord. Can you hold up the uh, poster for me? I'm going to do a little show and tell today. We brought a poster that is a picture that was taken when we visited the King Center about three years ago. And it's a picture that we liked so much that last year when Port Chester held a march uh, following the killing of George Floyd and in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, this is the poster that Philip carried as we marched. And it has the quote from Amos, different translation, not the uh, new revised standard that we heard this morning, but it says, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. So almost the same, a little bit different. Okay, you can put that down. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it makes me think today as I hear the words of Amos, you know, what does justice mean to each one of us? Uh, my father was a police officer in Cuba, so I, I was a cop's daughter for the early part of my life. We, we lived next door to a retired Rybrook PD sergeant. And so I, I have always grown up with an esteem and respect for the work of police, for law enforcement, that they are the ones who kept us safe. I'm also a big fan of police procedurals, especially the great one, the greatest of all, Law and Order, the original. And that begins, each episode began with in the criminal justice system and then went on to describe how there were two components. There was law, there was order. Law belonged to the police. Order belonged to the prosecutors. And they're the ones who were given the job of making sure that, the, that righteousness prevailed, that justice was upheld, that the good guys and the bad guys had different outcomes. The bad guys were always taken out of circulation, 
jailed, and that was that. And each episode made you feel like justice had been done. Even that, that thunk thunk sound throughout Law and Order. Some people have said it's the sound of a gavel. Others have said that it's the sound of a jail door clanging. But it served to reinforce the concept of justice. And when we look at the scriptures, there are over 170 references to justice in the Old and New Testaments combined. Uh, many of them, most of them actually use the word justice. Others describe what God's justice might look like, but it's important enough in our faith tradition and has been from the very beginning that it is a repetitive theme throughout the scriptures. And so as we think about what justice means to each one of us, making sure that righteousness is done, it's helpful to look at justice from God's perspective. And what comes to mind for me is Jesus's description when he was asked, which is the greatest commandment of all? And he summed the 10 down into the two, saying that the second commandment was like the first. And so you can sum up that to loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, with all that is in you, with the entirety of your being, and loving your neighbor as yourself. They go together. You cannot love God without loving your neighbor, and you can't love your neighbor without knowing how to love yourself. So God's sense of justice, I think, is rooted in that is in restoring right relationships, our right relationship with God, even when we have sinned, and right relationships with our neighbors, not just the people on either side of us or across the street, but Jesus's broad definition that everyone is our neighbor. So keeping that in mind, we go back to what God's intended order for creation was that was affirmed in Jesus. In God's creation, everything and everyone was in harmony. There was shalom. And Jesus tells us and shows us throughout his ministry that in God's sight, there is a preference for those who have been marginalized, for those who have been downtrodden. Those are the ones who will be lifted up for those who have suffered exploitation and injustices, for those who are on the margins, for those that even we who consider ourselves faithful followers of Christ still might think fall outside of the realm of worthiness. To think about justice is to keep all of those things in mind because justice ultimately is restoring God's vision of perfect and right relationship in a way that reflects mercy and grace. Now that all sounds very good from a theological perspective, but how does it apply to us as we look at the world that we live in and look at our lives today? And what does God's justice say to those situations in which we may be torn or conflicted about how we wish to see justice done? You know, we don't need to go very far. In this past week alone, think about examples of the justice system at work that we have seen. How a 17-year-old who crossed state lines and shot three people, killing two, has been referred to by some pundits as being just a kid who had to defend himself, whereas there have been many examples of kids younger than 17 who didn't have a chance to defend themselves, who were gunned down as they bought Skittles, as they played in their yard. Justice looks different in different communities. Think too about what we've heard this past week of the trial for the killing of Ahmaud Arbery that is unfolding in Georgia, and how those who are accused, the three who are accused of killing the young jogger, have a lawyer who said 
that they didn't want any more black pastors coming to the trial because that would be intimidating to their defendants. Justice can look different in different communities, in different contexts. We can ask everyone around this circle how they see justice, and we may get a whole lot of different answers, particularly as we look at it through the lens of what's happening today, but informed, grounded in our faith in Christ. That gives us a different perspective. When we look at justice, we think of the justice system, yes, of civil authority, but we must also think of God's concept of justice. Justice that is grace-filled, that is extravagant, that is abundant, that doesn't give us what we think we might have deserved, but that gives us so much more because God's justice is about balancing those scales. And God's justice is to flow like a stream that is unceasing, like that water that cascades in that photo at the King Center. It just keeps flowing and running down. God doesn't turn off the tap of God's justice. And so faith calls us to examine precisely those things that trouble us, those things in our world, in our society that trouble us. Faith calls us to look at them through a different lens. And it calls us to be on the side of those whom God has placed on God's side, the forgotten, those who implicitly or explicitly have received throughout their lives a message that they don't matter. The oppressed, the forgotten, the devalued. That's an uncomfortable thing for us to ponder, yes, but our task is to face up to our own uncomfortableness, to our own attitudes and actions, and always seek to right the wrong, to live according to God's justice. The prophet Amos reminds us that God doesn't want ritual and tradition. God isn't concerned at that particular time with sacrifices and following all of the rules of the Mosaic law. God is not interested in that. God is interested in our spirits, in our hearts. God wants us to seek good and to hate evil whether that evil is evil that we acknowledge in ourselves or whether it is structural or systemic evil. Dorothy Day, who founded the Catholic Worker Movement, a New York City woman who, is, uh, who said that she didn't want to become a saint, but there is a great movement to have her enter the process of canonization because of the incredible work and ministry that she did. But she is quoted as saying something which is very helpful for us to consider as we reflect on the concept of God's justice and what it means to live out that justice and love of neighbor. She said, I really only love God as much as I love the person that I love the least. I really only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. We cannot live in God's justice if we do not show love for the least whom Jesus considered his own kinfolk. And so today, let us be reminded of God's vision that justice requires mercy. Justice is rooted in grace. And let it roll down like waters and let righteousness flow like an ever-flowing stream. And may the rivers of living water flow out of our believing hearts in Christ's name. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people. 
set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth. We join in prayer for all God's creation. Almighty God, strengthen us as we are wearied by this pandemic that we may not lose all we have worked to protect. May we remember all those lost to the COVID virus. May we be more than thankful, loving God for healthcare workers and first responders. Remind us of our mission to be your hands for people in need. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of creation, you called everything into being. Sustain this world with your renewing care. We pray for all the victims of hurricanes, storms, and wildfires. Help us to meet the needs of others and instill in us a deeper wonder for the created world you've called good. May we generously share the abundance of your world. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy wisdom, bless all teachers and students, our Sunday school and all parents who are juggling work and childcare. Help us to nurture young minds with critical thought and young hearts with empathy and curiosity. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Paul. Bless church social service agencies and institutions, schools, hospitals, advocacy groups, universities and nursing homes. Bless scientists and journalists, communicators and artists. May we appreciate the many ways to discern truth. May we each discover how the talents that you have graced us with can be used to your glory. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Lord, may mercy and forgiveness reign in every community. Send your mercy and care to the sick and the troubled. We lift up Zinnia Santana, Marek Armstrong, Myrtle Bentley, Dennis Bushkovsky, Pam Caldwell, Santa Chan Carmona, John Capola, Joe D'Amico, Carol and Dan Denigris, Dennis Donnelly, Erica Emanuel, Farouk, Phil Fitzpatrick, Jamie Anafrio Francisquini, Emmett Gallagher, Muriel Junta, Judy Hinch, Pat Kemp, Bob and Suzanne Kraft, Johnny Little, Carol Long, Paul Marcucci, Michael McMeans, Marge Nevelsick, Tessa Pollock, Linda Pape, Sandy Price, Art Schmidt, Deborah Schock, Susie Smith, David Spengler, Reinhold Vogel, William Vogel. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our creator, bless all families, especially newlyweds Bobby and Akriti. Also, our new parents, including Medina and David, on the birth of their third child, Prince. Bless all who mourn the loss of loved ones, including Charlie Aldridge, Ryan O'Meara, Lucky Zero, Lucy Zero, Patricia Ann McBride, and Matthew Verrier. Bless those celebrating birthdays, including Dottie Simonelli, Julia Briteri, and Maeve O'Hanlon. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands. Through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. This time when we share with one another a sign of God's peace, I will try to remember, and perhaps you can coach me as to the right way it goes, but the peace of God be with you. Take a moment if you're with someone in a room with someone to also greet them with the peace of the Lord Christ. Peace be with you. And also with you. Peace be with you. And also with you. Let us conclude our worship by repeating together the prayer 
our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It is good to see all of you and to have shared in this time of worship together as we prepare now for our in-person service at 10 o'clock. Uh, please, if you've received the bulletin, look through the announcements for upcoming information about uh, services. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with mercy and grant you peace. Amen. Be at peace. Be safe. And stay connected. Thanks be to God. Does anyone have any uh, prayer requests or other uh, things you would like to share that we should bring to the next service? It's so good to see you. Uh, as Pastor Jim uh, has a habit of doing, we'll leave this on throughout the uh, uh, live service. And uh, please feel free uh, to join us. And uh, we'll look forward uh, to seeing you electronically or in the distant future face-to-face. Uh, -face. Bless you all. Good morning, everyone. It is good to be here and worship together on this Lord's Day. If you uh, look through the bulletin, you'll see some announcements about events this week, Bible study on Thursday at 4.30, and that is in person here at the church, masked and distanced, but here in the church. So it is a good opportunity to get together and to enjoy a time of fellowship there are uh, stewardship pledge cards in the back of the bulletin on page 14, and you are invited to thoughtfully and prayerfully consider your response to this call to generosity and to being part of a community in building up the community that helps us to be God's presence in our world. There are still... Um, and there's still an invitation to contribute to the Food to Grow On program. Uh, there were several items that were in the table earlier that people have donated, and thank you for that. Uh, some of the items requested are healthy cereals, not, not sugar-free, <laughs> not sugar-coated cereals, cans or packets of tuna fish and peanut butter in plastic jars, not glass jars, also canned fruit. And the, uh, the sizes of the jars and the cans are indicated in the bulletin. A reminder that on December 5th, which seems far away, but really isn't, it's only three Sundays from now, uh, the congregational meeting will take place following the service at 11 a.m. It will be offered both in person and on Zoom. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We call upon our God. Our cry is God's spirit interceding. Have mercy, Have mercy on me, O Lord. We are the people, we are the apple of God's eye. Have, Have mercy, mercy on me, O Lord. We are light and salt. Have mercy, mercy on me, O Lord. 
God leads us and guides us. Have mercy on me, O Lord. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Have mercy on me, O Lord. God died on a cross for us. God is our advocate, our very present help. Have mercy on me, O Lord. God covers us under her wings. Have mercy, mercy on me, O Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Have mercy on me, O Lord. God has a plan for each of us. We have been given a ministry of reconciliation. Send us, O Lord. We are ambassadors for Christ. Send, Send us, O Lord. We are a beloved people, a royal, holy priesthood. Send, Send us, us, O Lord. Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of all nations and people without a state, show us how to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Create justice and righteousness in us that all may rejoice in your blessings. Psalm 9, 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, the reviving the soul, the decrees of the Lord are sure, making, um, making what wise, the uh, simple, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening, lightingly, lightening the eyes, go more to be desired are than are they than gold, even much fine gold sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Thank you, Lecter. There's always room for scripture. <laughs> 